All right, so welcome everyone. This is our seventh webinar in a series that we're doing for the California Psychedelic Bar Association. Um, and I should note, as always, for our attendees that uh, we're recording the webinar uh, so that we can post it on our YouTube channel and hopefully on some podcast apps as well. Uh, I'm Rebecca Lee. I'm one of the two co-founders of the California Psychedelic Bar Association. And my connection to this space is that I'm also the general counsel of Journey Collab, uh, which is a psychedelic pharmaceutical company. Uh, my co-founder, Paul Slattery, is the general counsel of Eleusis, and uh, he's the true rock star of our organization because he's done really the lion's share of the work with our previous webinars, um, which you can also find on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'm trying to pick up the slack here and, and do a few more myself. So thanks for everyone for joining. Um, and I think hopefully Paul will be joining us later today as well. Um, I'm very honored today to be speaking with Hadass Altman and Adriana Kurtzer, the founding partners of Plant Medicine Law Group, which is a cannabis and psychedelics law firm that was founded in 2020. Uh, Hadass is an Israeli-American attorney born in Jerusalem and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has a JD from Berkeley Law and a BA in Community Studies in Agriculture and Social Justice from the University of California at Santa Cruz. She is a board member of the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association and a founding board member of the Psychedelic Bar Association, which is a national association. Um, she also serves on the equity subcommittee of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board and was the policy director of New Yorkers for Mental Health Alternatives, an organization that she co-founded that successfully lobbied for the introduction of a New York bill to decriminalize psilocybin by statute. And Adriana, her co-founder and partner, is a Brazilian-American attorney born and raised in Sao Paulo. Adriana has a JD from the Georgetown University Law Center, a BA from Brown University in Judaic Studies and International Relations, and an MA from Parsons, the New School for Design. She is on the board of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation and leads the Interfaith Working Group Faith and Psychedelics uh, and founded Juhu Tokes, an Instagram account that explores relationships with cannabis and psychedelics in the Jewish community. Fascinating to me. <laughs> uh, to join as uh, a as, lot of fun, a lot of fun to manage. <laughs> yes. So Hadass and Adriana, thank you so much again for speaking with me today. I'm really excited to, to have you both here. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's nice to enjoy the summer and kind of be in a little bit of a, a quieter part of the year and have a chance to to chat with you, um, present to this fabulous audience. And it's especially nice after putting so much work into updating our deal sheet to have a conversation at the tail end of, of reflecting on what we've done to date and the kind of clients we've worked with. Great. I'm just going to switch my view really quickly so that I can see you guys and feature you more prominently since you'll be doing most of the talking. Uh, make sure that I'm switching this here on a moment or two. Great. So um, just going alphabetically by last names, let's start with Hadass. So prior to founding uh, Plant Medicine Law Group, you worked with a leading cannabis law firm in San Francisco, led clients through successful cannabis license applications in multiple states, and served as counsel to equity applicants in Oakland and San Francisco, in addition to working with legacy growers in the Emerald Triangle. And you were a restorative justice practitioner and, immune, and, and community organizer as well. Could you tell me about how those past experiences have influenced your work with Plant Medicine Law Group? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, I started working in cannabis right out of law school. And so I think that those experiences are the ones that initially taught me how to practice law. Other than that, I don't actually think that my work in cannabis is the thing that most um, prepared me or compelled me to work in psychedelics at all. I think that the most influential factor in my life um, that prepared me for this is actually just doing psychedelics and having a relationship to the medicine and also to the community and understanding like the essence of what both of those things are about. Um, I think having a, you know, having respect for the medicine, having reverence from the cultures for which they come, the various cultures, um, and, you know, something I talk a lot about is one of the things that I first, one of the lessons that really landed for me, um, and I guess this is something we learn as attorneys with respect to precedent, but like, uh, just respect for elders and understanding lineage and what's come before us. I think that obviously we're in a space that's really rich in terms of innovation and new people coming in, and I think that's wonderful, but 
I'm constantly looking back and thinking about, you know, what do we need to preserve and what do we need to honor? Um, and how can that serve as guidance for what is going forward? Because again, new ideas coming in are super amazing and super useful. And like, obviously I, Adriana and I are both huge fans of innovation um, and understanding that certain things from the past should be left there. Um, but I think, yeah, that rootedness in, in lineage and my own lineage and ancestry, I think is, is sort of my North star for this work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And that resonates a lot with me. Adriana, you began your legal career as a corporate associate, so, sorry, corporate associate at Simpson Thatcher in their uh, Latin American capital markets team. Um, and then you, I think, uh, drew on your, your love of contracts and as, as an entrepreneur in the fields of contemporary culture, real estate, and cannabis. You were, I think, at the um, Obama administration as a senior advisor to the senior deputy chairman at the National Endowment of the Arts, and, and I think also did some, some other museum work as well. So I'm, I'm curious how those past experiences have also in, influenced your work at uh, PMLG. This is, I think, one of my favorite topics to, to, to talk about, which is, so I'm going to tackle it from a couple of different perspectives. So the first is that when, when we attend law school, nothing in law school prepares you for being a lawyer entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial lawyer, right? So running a small firm, setting up a small firm, um, or even bringing in business small or big firm. Um, so when I look back on my career and I see these this combination of traditional, very hardcore white shoe law firm, and then years weaving in and out of entrepreneurial realities, because some of the things I did over the past 10 years, I was an employee and other things that I did were through my consultancy or were independent contractor agreements. But that idea of the hustle and having to hustle and having to think about verbalizing your skill sets in a way that gets business, that is something that unfortunately, you know, isn't isn't taught in law school and isn't isn't easily taught, I think, in life. Um, it takes shadowing, it takes, it takes observing, it takes reading, it takes seeing people do cook up the magic to to make it happen. So when people ask me, oh, you know, you, how did you have such a weird background? How did you end up starting a law firm? You know, how does all this come together? And it really, in my mind, it's impossible to imagine running this law firm as a business without that combination of the grooming from a place like Simpson Thatcher, which is intense and sets extremely high standards. And then the reality as an entrepreneur. So learning how to set up a website, a digital marketing strategy, you know, uh, what kind of Instagram, what kind of Twitter account, the branding of a law firm, you know, not enough attention is paid um, in the legal profession to how much that is. So it's really nice when we bring on a client, we feel like entrepreneurs when speaking to entrepreneurs. And we understand, you know, when, when we sign up a mental health practitioner who now finds herself in a situation to set up a, 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 a ketamine clinic, right? She is all of a sudden a surprised entrepreneur and we are entrepreneurs. So there's a really nice way in which we really understand our clients because we see ourselves as, as entrepreneurs. I think the other thing that's really, really helpful is I'm extremely thankful for my time in the art world because I think it was fabulous preparation for dealing now with schedule one substances. Um, you know, the art world, like many other industries have a very kosher reality and then a very black or underground reality and a money laundering reality. And if you're navigating that industry, you need to understand that things exist on this gradient. And I think when dealing with cannabis and when dealing with psychedelics, not just as lawyers, just in these fields, in general, there will be explicitly legal behaviors and activities, and there will be, you know, incredibly what you might judge unethical and illegal behaviors. And then there's policy change that puts you sometimes in a gray area. So I think that the art world for me was great preparation in terms of 
understanding how to do diligence people, understanding how to do diligence intentions, and understanding that just there are industries that have this gradient, because I also think traditional legal education doesn't prepare a lawyer for dealing with nuance mm -hmm. of crafting what is possible um, for, for clients. Yeah. No, that, that resonates so much with me. I, I also spent a couple of years in the art world. I have a degree in art history. And so it's, it's always oh. <laughs> interesting to me and meet other lawyers who have that background and, and be like, yeah, no, it really is applicable. And, I, and especially your, your thoughts about being an entrepreneur first and really understanding the business. That's, I think, so valuable when you're talking to clients um, who, who don't have any experience, maybe in either of those things. And you can really offer them both the legal advice and, and the advice as a, as a fellow entrepreneur. So. Yep. All right, so let's see. Um, I'd love to just start diving in and talking about the firm's work um, and, and particularly asking about your work in the psychedelic space, um, although I know you do both psychedelics and cannabis, uh, just because we're here with the, the California Psychedelic Bar Association. So I'm hoping that one of you can describe to me sort of the general categories that your, your psychedelic clients are, are falling under. Let's start. Sure, yeah. So um, yes, when, when a, a potential new client crosses our threshold, there definitely is that immediate bifurcation of cannabis and psychedelics, because in cannabis, there's our California cannabis reality, and then our upcoming um, New York cannabis reality. And they feel really, really different from mm -hmm. psychedelics. So, you know, I know that our, our, our audience here are lawyers that might be interested in entering the psychedelic space. And what I'd say is we've seen a lot of people do what I call the cannabis slide, which is they practice in cannabis and then they just add psychedelics to their website. And, you know, it is an incredibly different practice area. Mm -hmm. The legal questions are different. The personalities of the clients are different. And quite honestly, the, the stakes feel different because you're really touching people's mental health and really touching people's souls and just the nature of the substances are different. So the gradients of consent are different. Mm -hmm. So within the psychedelic space, um, we divide our practice into a, a host of different areas. And I had to write them down because I always forget one. So, <laughs> um, so psychedelic clinics, which currently the legal incarnation for that are, is ketamine, although we do represent one, um, one clinic that is part of MAPS phase three uh, MDMA trials, mental health practitioners, uh, education in the psychedelic space, media, investors or funds, drug development. Um, and that's interesting because a couple of clients in the drug development space have decided to add us to their larger legal team. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not the primary lawyers for drug development companies, but they've made this decision to have our counsel added. Mm -hmm. And then entheogenic churches, and then kind of a catch-all category that we call other, that includes a breathwork studio, a medicinal mushroom blend, um, and online musical ceremonial uh, uh, platform. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's, it's really quite varied. That's, that's exciting. Um, and in just, just a couple of years, right. That you guys have been doing this. So that's, that's really fantastic. Yeah. It'll be two years this month that we started in stealth mode. And then our, our, our formal, you know, uh, launch was November 4th of 2020. So this is all in a very short period of time. It's terrific. So I'd, I'd love to just start to talk about some of the, the particular items on the deal sheet that, that you guys were kind enough to share with, with us so that, you know, we can start to talk about individual cases. Again, you know, as much as you can share publicly. But yeah, one thing that I noted that was interesting is it, it looks like you guys have worked with a practitioner group that leads psilocybin retreats in Jamaica. Um, and I'd be really curious to know a little bit more about what that work entailed. Sure. Hadass, you want to take a, a, an no, early... No. All right. Um, so it's really exciting to talk about psilocybin retreats in Jamaica this week for two, for two exciting reasons. So our existing experience was, um, representing us incorporated New York incorporated entity that was, uh, that is hosting, um, retreats in Jamaica. And so in that sense, it's from classic incorporation documents and, and reality 
to then really thinking through what is the package of documentation that a company and an attendee needs um, mm -hmm. to attend to run a safe retreat and to attend um, a retreat in a way in which all of the risk allocation and liability allocation has really been thought through mm -hmm. um, in a careful manner. And the first thing that we do when we act in any foreign jurisdiction jurisdiction is absolutely require the hiring of local counsel. Um, having worked on Brazilian IPOs um, as the first type of law I ever practiced, you know, you just understand that different jurisdictions have different needs, but also different cultures and different political connections. So foreign counsel in Jamaica is a lot more than just an education on the law. There, there are many other reasons why you absolutely should not be active in a foreign location without um, legal representation and also information at, into the culture and into the things that are not written in a, you know, in a legal text. Um, and so that's the first thing. And then what most, most recently got added to our retreat reality um, is the representation of mental health professionals that are being hired to work, at, uh, you know, in conjunction with legal retreats or at legal retreats. So we're really enjoying experiencing and thinking about these two sides of the same coin, which is what does it mean to host a legal retreat and drafting things like touch consent forms and mm -hmm. all the appropriate waivers. And here I really want to add, adding into the work that we do a very active awareness of what is panning out in the legal, um, in the psychedelic space um, for better or for worse. So if there are sexual harassment and sexual abuse cases that come out, we make it our business to track that information and to track what is being discussed because we're actively drafting a touch consent form at the very, you know, at the very same time. And then now being able to think about what does it mean to be a mental health professional with formal licensing, starting to do this crossover um, into the psychedelic space, um, which we know has existed in the underground, but, you know, we're now in a situation to start crafting this crossover um, legally and cross jurisdictionally. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's very fascinating. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I know you, you've also assisted, I think, a number of, of ketamine clinics, which I, I think mostly here in the United States. So, you know, I would love to know more about, you know, what what are the particular challenges that those clients are are encountering in, in your experience? Maybe a doc, you can answer this one. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's so interesting. I mean, I love working with doctors. I love working with psychotherapists. And one of the things that brings me so much joy, and I think one of the reasons um, corporate practice of medicine laws are so important, is that like, at least for, I'll speak for, you know, on all of our clients, their bottom line really is patient care. You know, like, I think the hardest thing is like, reminding them constantly that like, you guys have to make money. <laughs> like, <laughs> have, like that has to be part of this um, because they're really just so, I think that the way that they're trained, um, I find this especially true for the, um, for, for the, the therapist, but also for the, for the MDs um, is like, it's so deeply relational um, and it's so, you know, right now, I think that there's like this threat that they're all taking so seriously. They're protecting against the infringement of like the downward pressure that can come from outside capital, even when you have the MSO structure, which if they're taking on outside capital, they always do. Mm -hmm. um, and like the pressure of media attention. And it's almost like, you know, they are the ones closest to the work. The practitioners are the people who are closest to the work. I see them as like the, they're at the front lines. I mean, it's like the medicine, the patients, the practitioners. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's really an honor to feel like we get to help set up structures 
structures for them to do what they do and also for them to protect themselves and also for them to financially sustain themselves. And for some of them, like, you know, build intergenerational wealth for the first time. Like, I think that that's so cool and definitely takes some coaching. Um, and I think the thing, again, like going back to my initial comments about looking backwards and like helping, you know, the future be informed by what's worked really well in the underground and in the past um, is making sure that we're not just taking the law as the preeminent um, factor in how we structure these businesses. Obviously they need to be compliant and that's a big part of our job, but I think that there's such a big difference. Um, and I think like what we do really well and what we take a lot of pride in as PMLG and um, Josh and Allison are really good at this too, is like having a dialogue with practitioners and saying like from day one, hey, yes, we're the lawyers and yes, we have expertise, but you're the practitioners and your expertise is just as important. So tell us everything. Tell us how this needs to work. Tell us like we're going to write a waiver and we're going to write it. And like, we've refined our process over time. Um, and I think, you know, what we, we would put together today is really different than what we would put together a year ago. And so much of that is from practitioner input. Like you can have a waiver that's legally as conservative as possible, but that might not be the best thing for the therapeutic relationship. And so just negotiating things like, I'm like getting goosebumps talk about it like negotiating <laughs> things like that I just it feels really wild um to get to do that and to get to really help I think like foreground the knowledge of practitioners and the training of practitioners and and be like clear with them that they're actually helping to shape the 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 legal rollout of this industry, not just the medical rollout because it should all be I think it should all flow from like those best practices. Like we are here to bolster that and to institutionalize that. And I think that's part of mainstreaming um, psychedelic care into mental health and culture more broadly. Yeah. Yep. I wanna add a, a couple of things to that. Um, so the first thing is that the, some of the toughest intakes or the toughest due diligence that we've had to do as a law firm has been in the ketamine space. Hmm. Um, and if, if I hear Hadass speaking and she's using the word practitioner many times is because as I look back at the volume of potential new clients we've spoken to, but then who we've really landed on, you know, with as clients, it has been disproportionately mental health practitioners who have started their own um, ketamine practices versus other situations that were, for lack of a better term, entrepreneur-led ketamine businesses. Um, and so I'd, I'd say that, you know, as a whole, as a risk evaluation, as a dance with potential clients, ketamine has been one of the toughest categories to kind of weed out, you know, who are the people whose intentions and temperaments and you know, concern for patient safety, for example, would sit well with us as a, as a law firm and, you know, who are individuals that we just wouldn't feel comfortable um, working with as clients, not because they wanted to do something that per se was illegal. It just wasn't a temperament, um, a temperament fit. And it's also been interesting that it's been in the field of ketamine that our value in terms of relationships with other people and getting information about what's current, what's trending. Um, and then also hearing about what ketamine practitioners care about and folding that into our due diligence of potential clients. So for example, we once had a conversation with someone who wanted to scrape data on existing ketamine practitioners and create a website that was going to be yet another list and we know from the listservs that we're a part of and the communities that we're a part of that ketamine practitioners hate that. They hate having their information scraped even though it's publicly available. And they hate being put into lists that you know generate money for someone else and they have very little control or consent sometimes. So it's really important to, I'd say for anyone who's interested in entering this field to understand that your due diligence of potential clients is going to be serious. 
Um, and that, you know, you're not just choosing who is legal, you're choosing who is also a temperament fit. So it's nice to hear Hadas talking about practitioners because that has eventually been who we've ended with either because we haven't taken them on as clients or we've broken up with them as clients. I would also say one of the reasons that I use that word um, quite intentionally is because I think it's the I think it's the term that just is most inclusive with respect to, um, you know, just like medicine keepers who are not part of the medical establishment, and all you know for the most part they fall into the entheogenic church practice and the sacramental use um, category. Of, of our work. And that's like, obviously really different, you know, doesn't really overlap with ketamine clinics. Um, but it feels important to, you know, one of the things I think about a lot is like, we have all of these distinctions um, by necessity right now. Like there's um, personal use, there's beneficial community use, there's quasi legal, quasi I mean, quasi-medical, quasi-adult use, and then there's like the medical track. Um, and I think that those things are helpful and I think they're valuable. I don't think we're going to get rid of them, but I think it also just feels important for me to like constantly be infusing into the conversation that at the end of the day, like on some level, it's all sacramental use and that it's all spiritual. Like, I think it's all based in the spirit because this is spirit medicine, um, at least like that's my, that's my belief. And that's what I've seen. And that's what I hear from even the most, you know, I think there's this almost like U shaped reality where like when someone is so, um, the people who are the most deeply and firmly rooted in the science, I think like almost come out on the other end and are like, oh, wow, this is sort of like deeply spiritual. Um, and so, yeah, I just, as much as possible, I think because as lawyers, like we do need to categorize everything. I think like at least discursively, it can be really valuable to remember like the the oneness of all of it, because that's, I mean, I think that that's like a, a, a critical part of psychedelics just generally. No, I think that's so spot on. And, and what you said earlier too, about, you know, not having a waiver that's maybe overfitted and only focused on the legal issues. This is something I think about all the time, right? It's like, you know, it's something that I look for in trying to find outside counsel to work with a journey, right? Is, is our folks who really understand more about what the work we're doing is and understand the business needs, right? And so aren't going to give me something where it's like, you know, yeah, I could have like an employment agreement that's like 10 pages long, right? But like, is that really in our best interest, right? What those kinds of things. And you know, I just, I'd love to hear other people thinking flexibly about this and thinking not just about the legal concerns that their clients are facing, but the, the business and the larger spiritual concerns as well. And, and I agree, it's also been my experience in talking to the scientists about this and, and really everyone in this field that, yeah, there is this, it's in some ways, it's like the elephant in the room in, in some of the scientific discussions, people don't want to talk about the spiritual aspect, but I think you, you can't talk about this work without talking about that. So. And one yeah. of the things that we're really comfortable at is also sitting back and saying, okay, just because certain things happen in the underground certain ways doesn't mean that that right. should be the case. So I like that earlier Hadass used the term, I think she said like some things were in the past and they should stay there. I think one of the things that I really look forward to um, doing more and more is folding into ceremonial use or, or communal use higher standards of, 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 of behavior on everyone's behalf. So I think that for so many decades, people in severe need have gone to the underground for psychedelic therapy and have been kind of beholden to the fancy and the wildness of, you know, whoever they end up with. And I think, you know, this, especially to me as a feminist is important is to say, no, like some things are not okay. Like some things you shouldn't be coerced into feeling that you have to silence what your gut says on something. So there's this really interesting way in which I think that um, we can have reverence and we can have deep reverence for experience and, 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 and protocol development. But I think we also need to have the chutzpah to say, no, like 
no to certain things and and yes to higher standards um, um, all around. So that's something that I very much look forward to to helping um, continue to to develop. And I agree with that. Um, and I'm going to try to draw a metaphor here. Bear with me. It's like a summer Friday in New York and <laughs> my brain's like at 50% at best. But um, I think that legalization um, and, and expanding access to these medicines uh is we can understand it metaphorically as it's that's like the journey that's that's the trip right and then i think um the infrastructure with which these medicines get delivered regardless of like medical contacts you know psilocybin services whatever that's the integration you know it's like legalization gets us to the trailhead, but to actually walk the path, we need to be thinking about not just commercialization, although that's super important, but like, what are the standards of care for practitioners? Who gets to be a practitioner? What are the disciplinary processes for someone making a complaint? Do we just kick someone out of the practice or do they get, is there going to be more of like a restorative justice approach? Is it going to be a transformative justice approach? Um, what are the co cultural contexts that we're trying to cultivate for the receipt of medicine? Um, and then of course, you know, like supports for things like preparation, integration, et cetera. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's not like too, like that like makes as much sense. <laughs> <out loud> <laughs> right it's, right. it's hard to do the, the work before the legalization and then the integration work of making sure that it's done in a way that is not harmful to the public so yeah exactly yeah because really I mean I think like this is just this is mass scale healing um which is really hard to pull off <laughs> and I'll share here a, a a recommendation um of of, of how we're, we're talking about really is happening you know in the trenches um, listen to one of the latest episodes of Lynn Marie Morsky's podcast through the Psychedelic Medicine Association. With uh, it was an interview with Juliana Margot um, Mulligan, Juliana Mulligan, um, and it was a really fabulous podcast episode where Lynn Marie and Juliana talk about the kinds of questions and the kind of conversations people should have with a guide mm -hmm. and. Of course, the lawyer in me hears that conversation, and it's exactly the kind of know-how that I'm looking forward to applying to, you know, call it what you want, waiver, intake, you know, mm -hmm. standards of care. So it, it's a really great uh, interview that, yes, talks about the underground, but in our brains as, you know, founders of a law firm in the space, it's exactly the kind of podcast that becomes verbiage um in in documentation that's super yeah. interesting I'll, I'll definitely have to look that up yeah um so we, we talked a little bit about you guys also represent in theogenic um churches and i know that i imagine a lot of our listeners are at least passing familiar with the Relig religious freedom restoration act which allows for these theogenic churches to operate and and i also noticed that uh, one of your colleagues allison hoots um, wrote Shakruna's guide to RIFRA and best practices for psychedelic plant medicine churches. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I would love to know a little bit more about how you approach your work, uh, how the firm approaches its work with, with entheogenic churches. Sure. So we are incredibly lucky to have Allison Hoots as part of the team. And I'm, I'm very thankful to Stephen and Marcina of Reconsider to be for being the catalysts of this introduction. Um, I met Allison Hoots through them at a policy conversation um, that I was very, very uh, shabbily representing Hadass's policy brilliance. I'm like, why am I the one in this room? It should be Hadass, but I met Allison. And very early on, uh, we invited her to join the firm. And it really is an example of someone who is um, in the trenches in terms of, of ayahuasca communal practice and also is a lawyer um, and can think through uh, really the full circle on that front. You know, when it comes to kind of RIFRA practice, 
it is very much an Allison magic that we allow to happen. But where I particularly come in is um, in the intake process of any potential client, that initial due diligence is done by me and Allison in tandem. And the number one thing that we look for is, you know, the, the incarnation of the word sincere, right? That is part of, of, of RIFRA. It is also part of our due diligence. So sometimes what we see and we don't take on as clients is people kind of forum shopping for lack of a better term. So they want to use these substances, but they're trying to backfit the use of them into the RIFRA reality. And that gets very quickly and immediately absolutely denied as a client of the firm. Again, we are a business, we run risk analysis on any potential entanglement that we have because we cannot be seen as aiding and abetting in illegal activity. So what that means is a very, very high level of risk anytime that we're taking on an entheogenic church. So it's an extra layer of due diligence and a comfort that people who were advising really sincerely, you know, believe in what they're doing and want to follow Allison's advice because there are waiver forms and conversations about, you know, all kinds of things that have to take place and incorporation and 501c3 formation. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a commitment on behalf of the community as well that's hiring us to do all the things that need to be, need to be done. So it's a small area of the firm in terms of revenue or client number, but it's, um, it's an important part of the firm. And it's also a delicate part in terms of, 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 of risk um, assessment. You know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and you know, I think it's, it's so valuable that we have this resource that Allison put together for the community that people can look to that and also such a resource to have um, practitioners like you guys who really can work with with again you know the, the folks who really are and who do have that sincere belief um, and the most efficient and if I can I just I want to like just give Allison more more credit because she so deserves it I think the way that she approaches the work the the sacramental use church work is like with so much it's like nothing but humility and expertise and intellectual curiosity. Um, and I think because we know how she's approaching it, it's very easy for us to hold clients to the same standard. You know, it's like, we want everyone that Allison's going to work with in that lane to be worthy of Allison because she is going to be very much like worthy of them. And I think that that's like maybe a weird way to talk about anything that happens in a law firm. But I think with this, it's like, it's obviously different. Well, we're just going to have to get her on as well. And I, I am really? very excited to pick her brain about all that work. Um, yeah. it's, it's something that I find really fascinating. It's also, you know, of, of interest to journey, you know, not for our business, because, but because of our relationship with our community stakeholders, who obviously are, you know, members of the Native American church, et cetera, and, and, and you know, traditional spiritual users of the, the sac sacrament of masculine. And so, you know, always interested in, in, in learning more about that area and understanding, you know, how we can, how we can help them. So yep. that's great. Yeah. Um, next, I guess, so I also saw that you guys are doing some work in Oregon and, um, and that one of your clients, uh, is, is going to provide state approved training and certification for psilocybin therapy facilitators in Oregon, um, for their new psilocybin services program. Um, and that the, the this client is going to be focusing on BIPOC and LGBTQIA, uh, community, uh, facilitators. So, um, Hadass, I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit about like, I know you do a ton of policy work in this area, and I'm, I'm hoping to hear about how that informs your work with, with these corporate clients. Sure, yeah. So I'm um, I'm on the equity subcommittee of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board. Um, I'll also just say I'm not working on this matter. Josh, Josh Wolf is. Um, and I, I do also, I want to talk about our other attorneys more broadly and how that plugs into what Adriana and I do at PMLG, because I think it's really, really important. Um, but just going back to your question. So I think like in, in any kind of therapy, um, but particularly with psychedelics, I think just cultural competency is 
really, really important. And that's actually not always what everyone is looking for. Like sometimes, you know, someone wants something, you know, someone's like, I, the most important thing for me is like a non-directive approach or the most important thing is someone that comes from like a Jungian lineage. But for some people, they're like, a lot of my trauma comes from um, my sexual orientation or my ethnicity and how that's received by the world. And like, they want those services to be catered towards what, what it is that they need. Um, and so I actually, you know, I think there's a lot that could be said about how that is done. I think at this point, at least like in these communities, it's sort of a need that feels pretty self-explanatory. It's like, why do we have child psychologists? You know, like, why do we have people that specialize in, um, corporate law versus tax. I think it's like pretty much the same thing. Um, and that starts with training, right? Because it's like not every, like, I recently heard someone talk about how like they want to become a rabbi because they're Jewish and like people like them. And I'm like, not how it works, bro. Like <laughs> the whole journey. <laughs> um, and so it's like, not every queer person can be a therapist for queer people. Like that's, you really do need good training because it's not obvious and it's not easy. And like, I think, especially for communities that have suffered disproportionate harm, like they deserve like very, very suitable, adequate, beyond adequate care um so you know I think I, I'm really glad that we we get to represent clients that are putting that together training in Oregon has been um there's been some curveballs in terms of timing um which is totally reasonable when the, so you're the first state standing up an entirely new heavily regulated industry um but but we're happy and we're we're hopeful that it's gonna be impactful and done in a good way can I sing the praises of Josh? So, <laughs> so we, um, the fourth person that we added to the plant medicine law group is Josh Wolf. And we were lucky to have met him. He's an attorney in Oregon who is also barred in the state of New York. And we were lucky to have met him through um, someone in the psychedelic space who then became a client. And it's fabulous. He shows up in many different ways, but two very important ones. One is really being our person on the ground in Oregon. Um, and there's a real um, there's a real need for obviously psychedelically experienced law firms to, you know, provide uh, services and partner with local lawyers on the ground in Oregon. And the second way in which he's showing up that is just incredibly valuable is he has been a part of uh, Oregon's California, uh, cannabis scene since 2014. And so a lot of what's happening and this, I, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about this in terms of the law firm is a lot of what's happening is Hadass and Josh bringing their West Coast expertise to bear on our work for New York clients. And what's fabulous is to have a call with a client where it's either Josh or Hadass or both or whatever. And, you know, the New York clients are so nervous about something and, you know, Josh and Hadass are like telling stories or explaining that it's normal or explaining about- Or explaining they, that they should be nervous. Or explaining yeah. that they should That's be nervous. <laughs> so I think that, you know, what happens, whether it's psychedelics or cannabis, is that there's a lot of movement in the firm of figuring out where expertise is and where it can go, where, where you know, where something can be reframed. Um, and, and, and shared. And so there's a lot of that kind of traffic direction, but it really is fabulous to have a someone on the ground and then B have, you know, have someone who has that mature cannabis experience and is New York barred stepping in now um, to our work in cannabis in, um, in New York. So we're very lucky to have, to have Josh with us very much. So. Yeah. And I'll also just say, because this is what I was alluding to earlier about, you know, the people we work with being a very important part of our story, obviously. Um, I mean, I love Adriana and I tell her that all the time and I tell that to anyone who will listen. And, and the same goes for Josh and Allison. I think like the fact that we just adore and trust and respect each other um, within the firm 
um, is, I see it as so integral to what we do, because I think that the energy that we are coming to, um, you know, on a call or working on any matter is one of like really enthusiastic enthusiasm to be there. And I think we all feel really lucky to do the work and lucky to do it with each other and learn from each other. Um, and I think, again, I think about everything as like degrees removed from ultimately like the patient experience or the medicine experience. And like, what are we bringing to this? Um, and it feels important for that to be clean. And it feels important for that to be positive. And like, when there is challenge in embracing it and like, really like, as lawyers, I think we often shy away or like are not necessarily encouraged um, to bring our full selves into the work that we do. And I, you know, at least for my part, really try to, to invite that and to welcome that and be like, look, this is work. And obviously like we have to hold ourselves to the highest professional standards, but this is also life, you know? And I think that people show up better when um when there's just like space to be a person you know yeah. like space to be a, a human yeah I think that's that that really resonates with me I think that's so important and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys are really centering that in your work and it sounds like a really lovely way to to work and, I'll, and I'll, I'll 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 compliment that in my own style which is, <laughs> we have really different parenting styles <laughs> We have very different ways of living life. But what I'd say is one of the things that we tell our clients and we tell our lawyers or anyone that works with us is that just because we are a cannabis and psychedelics law firm doesn't mean that you're going to get any less professionalism from us. Mm -hmm. And so once, you know, I was an intern at Goldman Sachs. I was trained at Simpson Thatcher. I've worked in incredibly demanding environments with very demanding personalities and I am very demanding. And so what that means is that, you know, our project management standards are very high. Our communication standards are very high. Our emails are surprisingly formal. All of that to say that, you know, we can be a part of these communities and we can believe in these substances and there, and there should be no change in quality of service. So I think it's correct to say that, you know, it's sometimes surprising to interns or surprising to lawyers who join our team to see just how high the standards are and, and how um, vigilant I am of, 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 of quality of, of service. Um, and and, and client, clients, I think, really appreciate it because oftentimes we tell them, you know, please go meet other people before you hire us, get other lawyers to do a dog and pony show, get a sense of how they draft their emails, their engagement letters, how they talk, because we are not the chillest. <laughs> so like, come to us if you don't want the chillest, you know, cucumber in the refrigerator, because that is what we definitely are not. And I think in some ways, like, at least in terms of how, how we manage a matter and like how we communicate and the quality of the work that we put out, I feel like there's more pressure on us to be um, very exacting with our standards for ourselves because we're already in this alternative space, you know? And I think like the, one of the reasons I think it's valuable to have this like this familiarity and this, this feeling of like safety culturally within the firm is because everyone at this point knows like when anything is client facing, like it's on, <laughs> like when the cameras are on, you're on and like you are leaving whatever is happening in the rest of your life away um because i do think we're we're held to we're under a magnifying glass in so many ways and we want to represent ourselves well and our clients well and we also need to represent like not just the industry and the field but like the movement in a way that is serious and professional yeah no that makes so much sense to me and that, that's one of the reasons actually that paul and i first started talking about developing our organization right was that we really wanted to make sure that you know that this was about providing the highest quality of legal representation to this emerging sector. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly something that I take very seriously and it's, it's always great to meet other people who share that value. And, and that has definitely been my experience so far with almost everyone I've met in this space, it's great. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, I think this is helpful because we have a lot of our members who are interested in getting into the psychedelic space but may not actually be doing a lot of work in it yet. I'm curious if, you know, if each of you has advice um, for, for lawyers, um, you know, where is the work today and in the near term or, or what skills do you think that they should be developing if they want to, to get into this work? 
All right, I'll take the first um, stab. So a couple of things have been surprising, but I can fold it in as advice. So surprising how much uh, the learning curve for the firm on corporate, of pra uh, corporate practice of medicine has been. So I'd say in general, and this is like politics aside about, you know, whether you believe in medicalization, not medicalization, I'm just talking about, you know, licking the finger, putting it up in the air and thinking about potential work for lawyers in the field. I think that definitely healthcare law um, yeah. is, 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 um, is definitely um, important because the reality is, you know, let's say MDMA becomes legal, it gets offered in clinical settings, all of that infrastructure will be um, required. I think there is a lot of potential in the insurance world. So anyone who's a lawyer dealing with or in insurance companies, I think that there are fascinating conversations that still need to be had about um, insurance. We actually end up developing close relationships with certain brokers because our clients present needs that are that are novel. So I think there's definitely um, insurance. And one of the things that we should have said earlier, but it, it's worth saying now is that we are a law firm that focuses on infrastructure within the psychedelic space. All of our clients are um, by and large not in the biotech drug development space. So the advice yeah. that we're giving is because what we're seeing on the ground um, is 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 going in these um, in these directions. I think, um, yeah, and I think I think that's that those are the areas in which I'd say um, I'd pay a lot of attention to. Yeah. And I would also say, you know, we are expanding. So if you're interested in practicing psychedelic law, email us and 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 chat with us um, because also we're just always happy to to chat. And we always create relationships. We are in the business of having referral networks, both nationally and internationally, because we intend on remaining only New York, California, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and DC. But yesterday, for example, I just got a potential intake that looks fabulous, but it's Massachusetts. And so, you know, introduce yourselves to us, create a relationship with us, because we never know what state um, a request might come in. And, and usually people need our experience in psychedelic, in the psychedelic space, but we often will then need to have, you know, local counsel sign off on things. So it can be a really interesting way to learn is to work on, um, you know, to share a client with us. That's terrific. Yeah. No, I definitely encourage people to reach out to you and, and it's exciting to see this, this network growing in, in real time. <laughs> um, so since we're getting close to the end of our time, I just want to end with, with a bonus human interest question that my, my brilliant colleague Paul came up with in which we've really been enjoying asking all of our interviewees. Um, and so I, the question is whether you guys each, I hope, have a, a favorite fictionalized depiction of psychedelics um, for example, in a movie or in a TV show that you'd like yeah. to show. <laughs> Interesting. Well, first, I'm going to say that I actually keep a list. <laughs> oh, that's true. She and has they, a spreadsheet. <laughs> I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> and anyone who knows me will not be surprised. So uh, if anyone is ever looking to, you know, share their lists or add to my list or wants to see the list, let me know. We had an intern a, a few seasons ago help me um, beef it up. And then I'd say this isn't a favorite, but I think it's an important. I think that the Nine Perfect Strangers uh, mm -hmm. series with Nicole Kidman um, in a very fantastical, exaggerated way, actually introduces an important conversation about consent, right? Just because someone has challenges and wants to go to a retreat doesn't mean that they should be given substances that they don't know about, right? Mm -hmm. Bad interaction with pre-existing medication, psychosis, right? Like, like I think that that TV show was, um, was interesting and in kind of introducing, um, questions that people should should ask as they approach these um what to them might be new therapies mm -hmm. that's a great answer thank you hadas um so i feel like it's always changing i love this question at the moment something i've been thinking about a lot um is a piece written 
by um, Leonard, by William Leonard Picard, hmm. um, who, if you don't know about him, look him up, super interesting story, alleged to have produced like 90% of the world's LSD at one point. Um, really smart guy, Kennedy School policy fellow, just a wonderful human being. Um, he recently at, at Noya House, he read a piece that he wrote about someone who um, was stuck in a cabin in like the Alps or something, brewing a massive vat of LSD um, that fell on on them um and you know was the biggest dose of acid any human being has ever <laughs> been subjected to and this person thought that they were gonna die and was like kneeling in the shower and super freaked out and just sort of like praying waiting for the end waiting for some horrific wild experience and what actually happened was really peaceful and really beautiful and just felt like the natural mind mm. um, and what i takeaway from that, you know, every time I've heard it and when I think about it is that I really think like one of the most, maybe the most psychedelic experience that there is, is just being alive and being a human um, and being present in that experience. And it's just, it's such a gift. And I'm realizing more and more like the reason for the medicine is to be able to be here, right? Like just to be able to be here in this and see this for the deeply rich, beautiful blessing of an experience that it is. Yeah. A call to, to be here now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, can I add a, a call to the, to the listeners, which is, I think one of the things that I, that I want to end this conversation with is, you know, as people read newspaper articles and see media coverage or listen to podcasts about the psychedelic space, pay attention to what is not being said about the infrastructure that has to be developed for this industry or sector or whatever you want to call it to grow, to be possible, to be safe. And I'm not even adding yet, you know, equitable and, you know, and just, but I'm saying a lot of the attention that's given to psychedelic, um, practice or law or the industry is is about biotech or pharma or the substances and i think that one of the things that we realize in the work that we do is whether it's venture capital funding or journalist attention it's very very skewed in terms of where it's going in this industry and we all need to do a course correction and pay attention to what infrastructure, what training, what human capital we need um, to build this sector out. And so that's a challenge is in any article that you read, ask the next question, huh? In order for that to reach that person, what is everything that's required that maybe this coverage isn't contemplating? Because I think that will be the biggest challenge in this um in this industry for the next two years for sure right well and i think that like you know don't take our word for it read the intercepts report on the letter released by um uh the, the health secretary right like there is already so much interagency collaboration that needs to happen at the federal level to allow for the correct infrastructure to be put in place for once mdma clears um, the, the clinical trial process, right? Like that's what this federal task force is doing. That's where the next phase of all of this is, um, which is great because it's super interesting and it's super important. And I also think like we want to create more energy around that because like it needs dollars, it needs minds, it needs attention because it's it's critical. It's the, the bridge that's going to get us to where we need to go. I couldn't agree more. It's a very exciting time, and um, yeah, it's it's appropriate to to approach it with the right amount of caution. Surprise, statement. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you guys so much again. Um, this has been so interesting and so informative and really helpful. I hope for folks who are looking to follow in your footsteps or maybe collaborate with you in the future um, and just really refreshing also again to hear all of your really thoughtful approaches to, to how you do this work and how you built your firm and how you go about your practices. So um, thank you both again. Um, again, this is the, the California Bar Association's webinar series um, and we'll close it off there. Um, Looking forward okay. to seeing work again. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Ciao. You. Ciao. Bye. Bye.